Hello and uh, good afternoon. My name is Nico Heller and this is Reboot 2030, the Democracy Schools podcast and YouTube channel. Uh, my guest today is uh, Professor Susanna Cafaro. She is a professor of European Union law at the University of Salino, Salento, excuse me, uh, in Italy, and she was awarded a Chamonix chair uh, from the European Union in 2019. She's authored and edited numerous books and written more than 50 scholarly articles and book chapters. She's joined the Young European Federalist in her teens and has been a European activist since. Now she's one of the really sort of the great, great kind of like per, really sort of legal scholars um, in um, international organization law and uh, international law and of course European law. And I'm really pleased to have Susanna uh, with me today. Uh, so I can see that she has arrived. So let me invite her in. Susanna, hello. Hello, Nico. How are you? I'm good. I'm glad to see you. Thank you very much for joining me today uh, for this um, Reboot 2030 podcast and YouTube uh, live stream. Um, Susanna, we have a rather interesting topic today. It's interesting because, in part because it was a big thing last year uh, during COP27. It really, the world was focused on this whole question whether there would be a loss and damage fund at the end of COP27 or whether the international community could not agree. Um, and in fact, it was, it was the the developing world, the southern hemisphere was dragging its heels. They were very, very keen on this to happen. Um, Europe and North America, they were much more in favor of reforming existing institutions. Now we're going to be looking today at, at these two options and whether, you know, whether, you know, uh, the right decision has been made and what the, the opportunities are uh, that are now sort of flowing from that. But sort of let's kind of start with this first question. What was the rationale for creating a, a new institution? Uh, and why specifically did uh, developing countries, countries in the global south, uh, insist on that solution? Well, thank you for the question, Nico. There are, I think there are many different reasons. One reason is maybe in the focus, because the existing international financial institutions have quite a wide focus on whatever is about development. Uh, while uh, this focus would be dedicated, this, uh, this new fund would be specifically dedicated to loss and damage uh, related to climate change. And so this means uh, a, a specific, uh, a hopefully bigger amount of money on what is considered to be the emergency of the, of the millennium or <laughs> more than the century, I would say at least of the, the millennium, the, the, big, the big emergency of, of humanity nowadays. And, uh, and so one is uh, the hope of having a bigger stock of funds. But I think the second and not less important reason is that existing financial institutions are dominated largely dominated by uh, developed countries. And, uh, uh, and so the developing ones don't see um, uh, really um, a, a window of opportunity for having a, a voice in, these, uh, in the existing ones. And so for pushing uh, for a more relevant role. And uh, so I think they hope to have a different governance structure behind this fund? Sometimes I think you have, you know, I think people have made a similar case for the European Union. You know, there is this question, do we keep reforming or do we start from scratch? In fact, this question is a question that any systems thinker asks themselves all the time. About software development, same thing, right? So often they start building software again from scratch rather than kind of bring out yet another iteration or another version. And I think there is something to be said about this sort of starting from scratch. We come to this in a moment, uh, but um, I, I, there's a couple of other points that I find sort of pertinent when it comes to this whole tug of war, this sort of, you know, power struggle, if you like, between Northern and Southern Hemisphere, between those who have the money and those who need the money, essentially. Yeah. Um, and, um, 
and, and for me, there's two, 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 two issues, and maybe we can keep them in mind as we move through our discussion, because of course, to me, this new institution would have to address these issues head on, because just by saying we do a new institution, these issues aren't actually resolved. And one issue is clearly transparency. Um, so if you mix in um, all the funding for like climate change with all the other funding that is going out for other purposes, it is much harder to kind of to make a strong case for climate funding. It's much easier if you have that as a standalone fund, there's much more transparency. And of course, you can in a new institution build in additional layers of transparency um, to, to even improve uh, that even more. Uh, the other issue, which is kind of very closely linked to that is trust. Um, I mean, you could equally as well have said, well, let's reform the institution, let's give Southern Hemisphere nations, developing countries, more seats at the table. I mean, that would have been another option, you know, of course. Yeah. Um, but there clearly was a perception that that wasn't going to happen. Uh, so, so, so in a way, it's a bit like the Security Council. I mean, is this going to be reformed? Is it, you know, it's a similar kind of, it's a stasis that kind of to, to break that open is very, very difficult. And I think developing countries saw that. Um, so, so these are, I think, two issues that I'd like to kind of come back to in our conversation. One has to do with transparency, and the other one has to do with trust and linked very closely to that within the context of democracy, uh, accountability, because there can't be trust without accountability, of course. So, so these are, I think, the big elephants in the room, I think, as we kind of move, move through our discussion today. Um, transparency, trust, and accountability. Now, so what would have been different? I mean, let's just go back to this idea, let's reform the old institutions. What, what would that have entailed? I mean, how realistic would that have been? What would have had to happen for this to become an acceptable proposition for developing countries? So we had an attempt at reforming the IMF and the World Bank after the big financial crisis in 2008. And uh, I cannot say it came to nothing, but it, it became a very little thing compared to the, to be, the big ambitions that we had at the beginning because uh, both of them are uh, built on the assumption uh, that they are uh, similar to companies with shares, and these shares are controlled by countries according to their um, quota in the, in, the, um, in the budget, in the, in the fund itself. IMF or World Bank. So the more they contribute, the more shares they have when it comes to decisions. So this means that uh, uh, the largest part of the members, which is all the developing countries, have votes that we can define as zero point something, while the, the big countries have 17%, uh, the US, uh, the aggregated the European countries have about 30%. And uh, a, a number of, of relevant countries who don't even have so many, many shares have still a seat uh, by themselves in the, in the board, like China or Saudi Arabia. So it's really a reflection of the riches of these countries. So really what I mean is to use two passwords. So what would have had to happen for this reform to have any teeth from sort of a, a global south perspective, this would have had to be a shift from a shareholder mentality to a, a stakeholder mentality. Yeah, a stakeholder yeah. as in we all have a stake in, in the world, in the world economy, in, in, in also in, in the climate and all the rest. Uh, and rather than base it on, if you like, on a traditional shareholder model, the more I pay in, the more I own, uh, to base it on a stakeholder model, the more this affects me, the more you know, the, the more say I will have, and I think that, of course, was a shift that is you know very very difficult to 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 to, to even to think of uh, in that yeah. context. Even to think of it because we need eighty percent of shares to change the structure, and of course this means that you have to have all the rich countries on board to change the structure. But what if these are the losers in the governance reform? So this will never happen. I think uh, the the. One possibility could have been to add to this uh, uh, governance, to this uh, uh, governor's body, a second chamber with stakeholders. So to have both the shareholders in one, in one chamber and in a second chamber, the stakeholders. Even because when we come to uh, climate, 
Among the stakeholders, uh, we need to, to, to give specific relevance to very tiny countries which are risking their same existence, like the insular ones. And these are countries which are incredibly small in the, in the scale of the shareholder system. So the big novelty of the loss and damage fund, if this keeps some of the initial promises, is giving visibility to these very, very small countries which are uh, more at risk with climate change. So one possibility, just to kind of get this straight in my head, would have been to sort of say, well, we keep the World Bank as, as it is with its sort of shareholder structure and with this kind of lines accountability and with its processes and procedures. But we add to that a, a second chamber. I mean, this to me sounds very much like the kind of the constitutional arrangement of a, of a government or, or, you know, you know, where you have got a, you know, you know, you have got a Senate and you've got a House of Representatives or you have whatever. So it sounds a bit like that, doesn't it? What would yeah. in your thinking would it be mm -hmm. the relationship between those two chambers? Uh, I think it would allow to express different interests and different balances of interests in the two. And so uh, linking the decision process to a double approval would have uh, mean that the, 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 the rich countries should mediate with the majority in the other chamber, which is maybe inverted with the more at risk countries having the majority. And uh, uh, as all the studies demonstrate, the, uh, the climate change affects much more the developing countries than the, 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 the northern hemisphere in general. For a number well, of it's, it's interesting. Reasons. It's interesting, and it, it clearly does affect. There is a, a, a massive sort of climate injustice that, that is built into it. Um, there's no question about that. But of course, from a kind of a kind of economic or a sort of dare I say from a capitalist perspective, of course. You know, northern countries, you know, this affects us as much because our economies are a threat. And of course, we are supposed to be back. So, so when you think about it in terms of who is going to be affected in terms of financially, it clearly it would be the kind of the developed world. And that's why they don't want to get, you know, they want to hold on to the, the purse strings. They want to hold on to the, uh, the control over the funding because they feel that if they lose that control, um, you know, they, they would be, it could be very, very expensive for, for them. Um, so, but but this is an interesting idea because once you had those two chambers, and as you said, there could be kind of a, a, an interesting relation between the two. There could be funds within the existing World Bank that would become subject to that second chamber as well, which would increase, massively increase the funding of that second chamber as it is locked away in the World Bank. It, it is still very much under the control of, of you know, the developed world. So in a way, I kind of wonder whether this was actually sort of like the most efficient and most useful decision to have it as entirely standalone or whether the kind of the developing world has painted itself into a corner. I mean, we, you know, we come to it because of course, when you look at other European, sorry, uh, uh, United Nations funds, uh, I mean, take the refugee funding, they're absolutely undercapitalized. So, you know, just, just because you have a fund doesn't mean that it's, you know, that, that it's actually, uh, that the money is actually forthcoming. Um, and, and so, I mean, in your own kind of way of thinking, um, what kind of, I mean, you've named a couple of ways in which this could be linked. Um, um, would that be like, what would be the, 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 the in, in your kind of way of thinking about it as a kind of a democratic settlement as well? Uh, what would be the, uh, the main contour, so the main kind of, you know, characteristics of such a, a two-chamber organization? Well, I think that we have uh, um, not only to imagine something completely different from the, from the existing international uh, financial institutions, because uh, we should have a different balance of powers, uh, or at least a, a mediation between different, different uh, uh, interests at stake. But there is also another, I think, another uh, stream uh, of thinking, which is uh, the problem of where we get funding and uh, how we could persuade states to, to give more, or at least to give more for climate. And uh, a possible solution could be to have a multi-stakeholder platform. So having on board also the business community and the finance community and maybe the civil society as well 
because in some of these processes, for instance, in the United Nations Environmental Program on in the, in the same COPs as observers, we have many civil society organizations. So it could be interesting having as advocate of the Global South also civil society from Global North, because most of civil society is from, from Northern Hemisphere, but still advocates for South. So this could bridge the, 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 the two worlds. And uh, also having the, 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 the uh, finance uh, on board, we can imagine also new tools for finance, for green finance and bonds, for instance, imagine as climate bonds uh, respecting certain conditions, because uh, unfortunately we cannot imagine uh, issuing specific bonds by the international organizations for climate, or at least it's very difficult to do so because we need guarantees beyond, behind bonds. So all these guarantees come from the private sector, or these could come from governments themselves. But this means moving uh, financing, some of the financing on other goals to the, to the climate goal. And uh, we could uh, uh, try to learn from the European experience. We have, uh, for instance, uh, the, the next generation EU, which is a big plan to finance uh, uh, the recovery after the COVID pandemic, but also with the main goal to green European economy, to make more green the European economy, so also reducing emissions and uh, to digitalize European economy. And inside this next generation EU, there is a specific fund dedicated to the, to the uh, economic transition of weak areas, which is the Just Transition Fund. So inside the Union, you see there are already some dedicated tools uh, which are in the, in, the, in the logic of the transition from the old economy to the new green economy with the, with the lower emissions. Point is that the European Union can issue bonds because uh, the, there are uh, European governments behind guaranteeing these bonds. So this new fund should, uh, or this uh, new, new, let's say, reinvented World Bank should have more guarantees by the member states, which means going beyond the, the donors mentality and uh, involving the state budgets in some way. And yeah, no, so no, absolutely. So, so in, in terms of thinking about a sort of a, a multi-tier structure, um, um, you, you basically would be able to fine tune to, to, to engage in a much more direct and efficient way uh, with different stakeholder groups that may have funding to contribute, but only under certain conditions. And of course, a multi-stakeholder and a multi-tier kind of structure could accommodate that much better than a one-size-fits-all major fund. Um, so that, 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 makes, that makes perfect, uh, perfect sense. Um, one, one aspect, of course, is some of that thinking, and we'll come to that, could be applied equally to the new fund, to the new loss and damage yeah. fund. Um, the, the one aspect that we're losing now, of course, by having this as a separate fund, uh, is, if you like, the funding within the World Bank that is already dedicated, if you like, to, to climate issues. And there's the question whether the World Bank will transfer these funds across and say, mm -hmm. well, now you have it. Uh, my guess is they won't, <laughs> because why should they? Um, so, so, so that funding will continue to be managed and sort of, you know, um, delegated by, 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 principally by, by uh, developed countries. And I think there's a potentially a lost opportunity here. Um, now, one question, and this is sort of, of course, also a hypothetical question: Should it kind of turn out that to to have this sort of standalone loss and damage fund? isn't quite as successful as people thought it might be. Would it be possible in your view to integrate it into the World Bank at a later stage? To, to basically kind of, to have your multi-tier structure as a second step, once it's kind of clear what that second chamber would look like and one could actually design it with that as one option in mind? I think this could be an option. Uh, at the moment, all the options are open because uh, what uh, has been uh, presented to the public opinion as the biggest success of this COP27 was the idea that we have decided to create this loss on the match fund. But actually, it has not been created at all. 
it has just been established as a, a, a transition committee in charge for imagining this fund uh, to be adopted in the next conference of the parties, so in one year time. And this means that there is nothing at all at the moment. There is only this trans transition, transitional committee, which in itself is interesting because it has 24 members, which is the, the same number of members of the IMF and World Bank board. So it makes us imagine that this could be in the in, in, a, in a further step, the future board. And uh, but it is built in a completely different way because of these 24, 14 come from developing countries, and there are quotas for Africa, quotas for Asia, quotas for the Caribbean. But there are also two seats reserved to insular states, which is complete novelty, and two seats reserved to the least developed countries. So I suppose on a rotation base, this could become the new the new board of the fund. Point is how a, a fund which has the majority of, of uh, uh, members of the board from developing countries will get the financing. So, but the interesting thing is that um, the decision uh, appointing this transitional body uh, asks for contributions of ideas from states, from uh, institutions, current international financial institutions, and for, uh, from other organizations related to the fund, such as the UN, UN, UNETP or WMO or IPCC, the panel on the panel, the UN uh, panel on climate change. So it's it's all to be to be created yet, and uh, I think this could be in itself a transitional fund to be after integrated, or it could become. The, the tool that the World Bank, IMF, and other regional development bank use as a collector of funds for climate. And that could be the big success if they decide to pool what is already existing in different rivers or streams of financing in one place to be destined with the, let's say, neutral or uniform criteria to, to address the climate uh, emergency. Now, I mean, the, 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 the way they have set this up, this this this, this interim committee, it, it does actually sound quite promising and it does sound um, interesting, uh, yeah. I, I find, because it does really kind of take the stakeholder approach very, very seriously. Um, of course, the question is, how do you move from there to actually capitalizing the fund? That's the, that's the big, uh, big, big question. But we'll we come to that in a minute. But first of all, um, this is the design phase and the different, different, you know, large international organizations, governments, and so on and so forth are invited to contribute ideas or to, you know, to, to provide feedback or whatever. Um, is there any possibility that say a university alliance, not just one university, but you know, there may well be a university alliance that you can think of that could kind of couple together a bit to sort of say, well, here's like, you know, 10 world renowned, scholars international law and european law scholars and together we would like to have a voice uh to, you know as far as the design because it's a once in a lifetime opportunity is there is there any kind of structure that would kind of provide for that i confess that it was my first thought when i saw that it was a work in progress how can i contribute or pull colleagues and contribute all together when when I went to 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 look at the decision and uh, at the specific point when there is written uh, um, states and international financial institutions can submit proposals on the portal, my first action was actually clicking the link to the portal, and unfortunately I wasn't allowed to to get in because only members accredited to the conference of parties of UNFCCC can access that portal. So actually, I, I cannot. <laughs> okay. And so, uh, I don't know if some uh, think tanks, uh, such as from maybe the UN University, I don't know, maybe they can, but uh, apparently governments and international organizations are the actors 
actually able to get in this portal. So I, I was wondering, I mean, of course, it probably would need a kind of a high level sponsor anyway to kind to to to, 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 to gain traction. But somebody like Draghi, for example, you know, your former prime minister, who has like, you know, like is a technocrat through and through and has got the European experience and perspective and probably is really bored out of his head right now. I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> uh, he could be. That's an interesting idea. You know, somebody like somebody like him who is still actually could do stuff. You know, he's not he's not really gone, but he doesn't really. Wouldn't that be an idea if if if, if a couple of high level academics kind of rally around somebody like Draghi and sort of say, "Well, look, this is a this is something an opportunity we have to grasp." Um, can you not get in touch with like two or three whatever you know former heads of state or heads of state in the global south and see whether we can put together some kind of alliance to make this really. To, to, to bring an academic university perspective to this. Wouldn't that be an interesting kind of push? It would only require like a few emails to kind of to, to get to get some kind of a dialogue I, going. I definitely think this is a great idea, Nico. Thank you for giving this to, to me. And uh, I think we should definitely try. And uh, if we cannot really send it to the official addresses, we can always use the good old way of publishing a yeah. manifesto or uh, sending uh, an email to the, the, the secretariats of the uh, G20 presidencies or this kind of G7, which is in charge of finance. And by the way, I think that whatever they decide to do with this fund, it should be related to the existing organizations and institutions because it cannot live on its own. So for instance, that the 10, the 10 countries representing the North should be linked to the G7 as well as the, 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 the 14 should be in some way linked to the group of 70 or let's say um, uh, also have a, have a connection with the regional integration organizations such as the Mercosur, the African Union. So to enlarge the perspective also to those who are not in the room. So I think uh, as well as the European Union could be behind the, the European or together with the European states interest. So I think we need to have as more actors on board as possible. And uh, also that we should link this fund to the, in some way to the existing uh, financial institutions because uh, we need uh, to, to pool the existing resources. So maybe we can imagine also some additional mechanism where the, the resources of this fund are used as multiplicator together with the private sector or with other financial institutions. So starting from scratch, I think we can imagine whatever. What we need is uh, some pretty credible. So uh, as you say, trust is, is fundamental, some credible governance structure. And uh, I would be very much in favor, for instance, of having a, a board of independent officials so appointed by states, but not controlled all the time by states, because this means having negotiations on single loans. We need a, a general, let's say, planetary perspective, because we have a planetary issue. So I think once appointed, this, board, this board should be independent enough to make evaluation in the interest of the global community, even if uh, 14 are from some countries and 10 from some others. Absolutely. I mean, I like this idea of the, the thing is, I mean, I think there's one would want to kind of explore two tracks there, wouldn't it? You, one would want to try to get some sort of, you know, hard hitting sponsors on board. That would be great because they have much further reach than than I would ever have or whatever or, or you or whatever to have sort of a former head of state would really help. Um, but at the same time, as you said, it would be really interesting. I like the idea of a manifesto. I mean, you know, if you had, say, five, that's an easy number to remember, five governing principles that the entire sort of academic community kind of galvanized behind, that would be a great thing. I mean, it would make for a great conference. It would make for a great publication. It would, you know what I mean? It, it would kind of create... A, a, an interesting kind of dynamic. And of course, one would hope that it would be taken on board. Obviously, the more successful uh, uh, this this becomes as a sort of as a as a movement, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, the more impact it would have as well. But even if it was 
even if it would remain within academic circles and if it would remain a kind of a thought experiment, uh, it would be, it would be, I think, a really valuable exercise to do. And so to say, well, what would be the five governing principles that would really lift this onto another level? I say five, it could be seven, I mean, it could be 10. I mean, it doesn't have to be five, but it should be a small number that people can keep in their mind when they talk to others. Um, and, and so I think that could be a really interesting way. And of course, um, one would almost want to have some kind of conference built around that, you know, um, because obviously you wouldn't want to decide that yourself, you know, or whatever. You would have to have some kind of, you know, consensus building process around around these principles. But I think that would be a very, very interesting thing. So um, starting from scratch um, obviously means that we can leave all this baggage that we associate with 20th century, essentially post-war uh, institutions behind and really design something fit for the 21st century. Um, and um, I mean, if you would have to describe the opportunity that you see there in, 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 a, in, a, in a few sentences, what is the real opportunity there in, in your mind? Well, I tried to do this that you are saying now. So imagining a few, a few bullet points. And uh, I definitely would say a multi-stakeholder assembly. So to having on board not only states, but civil society and companies, a, a political guidance, which could be related to the existing bodies such as G7, but would be even better to, to be the evolution of this transitionary committee having on board the most affected countries to the, along with the, with the rich ones. An independent executive board accountable, so which can be removed in case of maladministration by the assembly or by the majority of states. This is yet to be invented, but the point is having some accountability. A, a membership of regional integration organizations, so to create a multi-level system. I would love to see an advisory role for the civil society also in uh, the form of some kind of participatory um, e-democracy, such as uh, open consultations online on the, on the main policy and strategy decisions, and uh, maybe also some kind of motivation behind the decision. So not just uh, uh, the, the traditional negotiated uh, behind closed doors decisions, but some some process which is explained with the motivation. So we decided to do this because of that, or because the consultation told us this, or that the scientific community explained us that this would work better than that. So some kind of um, visible process behind decisions, which could be in the motivation or in an explanatory document, whatever. So I think this could be the main point. So, multi-stakeholder, political guidance, independent and accountable board, uh, regional organizations on board, civil society in some advisory role or participating online, and motivated decisional process, transparent decisional process. I mean, in, in my mind, um, for me, the, the, the governance of, of the uh, loss and damage fund has, has, has sort of, a number of, of, of key functions that, that it has to serve. Um, uh, one is, of course, it has to administer funding in a, in a kind of transparent and a kind of a, a non-corrupt way, you know, so that it, you know, there has to be a, a level of kind of accountability at, at a kind of, at that financial level. Um, and um, so that that's one aspect it has, has to be able to do. And, um, but the, and another aspect, of course, it has to have, and then beyond that, I'm sort of thinking about really two sides to this equation, a sort of, if you like, a, a supply side and the demand side. Mm -hmm. And on, on the supply side, it's about how do you get the money in? And so what are the kind of governance arrangements that will help to basically build the fund? Um, and I mean, when you think about governance arrangements that help to build funding, you think about obviously direct involvement of people on the ground, because as you say, if I'm a citizen and I am worried about climate change and I have some way of kind of influencing decisions about how climate funding is distributed, you know, I, I, I may kind of try to make use of that influence in some form or another. So I think participatory approaches 
um, will, if they are, and they need obviously, obviously ought to be geared towards the, the kind of the, the donor countries. Uh, that's the supply side. And, and of course, the kind of thing, the sort of participation we look at there is quite different from the participation we look for on the demand side. Because on the demand side, again, there is great scope for innovation. Rather than kind of making big chunks of funding available to corrupt governments, which and the funding will just vanish uh, in thin air, how about things like microloans? How about all kinds of ways of making sure that that funding actually gets to where it needs to go? Um, so again, on the on the demand side, I think participation by farmers, by people on the ground, and, and to create a governance structure that allows for that would be really quite revolutionary. Um, and you can use all kinds of technology, of course, to do that as well. I mean, in the developing countries, people do use mobile phones and text messaging in all kinds of ways. So you could have voting mechanisms, you could have all kinds of forms of participation also on the demand side. So for me, if I were to structure this kind of fund, I'd be thinking, well, the sort of requirements, the kind of the governance kind of principles that I would apply to the supply side would actually be quite separate and quite different from the kind of the governance and the kind of participatory principles I apply to the demand side. And in a way, the governance structure would have to somehow bring those two sides together. I mean, that's how I kind of see that. If you go through your list bullet points once more, could you maybe just use that kind of notion of supply and demand side and see how your structure that you're proposing or the kind of innovations that you're putting forward, how they would already sort of deal with some of these supply side and demand side issues? Well, I, I totally agree with you. We could have both uh, uh, people on board on the supply and on the demand side in different ways. For instance, on the supply side, we could have also some kind of crowdfunding for some specific projects. Why not? If people is on board, if people participate, they could be also interested to contribute. That's right. Maybe from the maybe from the north, but it doesn't matter because in the end, the main message about climate is that it affects everybody, maybe in different ways, but it affects everybody. And uh, on the uh, demand side, there is a very important uh, reform that I would love to see in the IMF and World Bank. IMF and World Bank are not only intergovernmental in the governance structure, they are intergovernmental also in the demand side, only states can apply for funding and only states receive funding. I think we should overcome this uh, necessary state level and be able to fund directly communities and uh, maybe also projects. Projects can be already multi-stakeholder, for instance, or can be university projects, uh, uh, NGOs projects uh, together with local communities. So we can imagine direct funding where needed, especially when we have to deal with not, not so democratic countries. So it's really difficult to reach out to the really people interested in the, in the, in the financing. So I, 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 once again, I imagine something which already exists in, uh, in, uh, in some European uh, funds where there are uh, uh, open calls where whoever can build a network and apply for funding. So I would love very much to see that um, we overcome this classical intergovernmental model where only states can be actors. We, we are nowadays in a world made from so many different actors and multi-stakeholder organizations do already exist. For instance, the international, uh, the the internet um, organization, the, 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 uh, I don't remember the exact name, but the, 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 there is the, this, uh, this, uh, this internet governance uh, body, which is already a multi-stakeholder multi -stakeholder platform. It has the, the big tech companies on board, because you cannot imagine to regulate internet without the companies or ignoring the problems or the needs of the companies as well. So I think they should go also, uh, should be also the big novelty of this fund, overcoming the classical intergovernmental model and having 
people on board in all the possible roles. So as donors, as recipients, as civil society advising, as people uh, participating into consultations online, but also as, uh, as uh, watchdogs, because uh, international uh, civil society is also in many organizations, the watchdog looking at the policies and criticizing what doesn't work. And so it's also important having some Climb, climbing uh, uh, mechanisms for complaint when, when things do, do not work. So it's, it's a complex uh, structure to imagine, but I think we have a lot of experience from the existing uh, authorities and, and uh, institutions, so we can pick the best practices from many different organizations. I mean, my, my, my sense is, is that uh, one of the kind of the key functions in terms of making this uh, really kind of a 21st century organization, international organization, is, is that it, it brings a different, you know, sites closer together. Um, I mean, it, it's interesting. I mean, there was a time, I remember it was back in the 1990s, early 2000s, when a number of international development organizations decided to move their global headquarters to the global south, even though they were kind of founded in, in the UK or in, in, in other countries, but they, they then decided that actually um, for credibility's sake, in order to be closer to the people that they're serving, uh, that they should have their global headquarters uh, in, in the global south. I thought that was, it's, it's a very interesting, obviously a very logical thing to do. Um, and I think and when, when you think about a loss and damage fund, um, one way of kind of bringing the developing world closer uh, to the, 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 the developed world and also in so doing, making it much clearer and more clear to see for everybody you know, where the needs are would be to actively create structures where specifically people from the global south have an active participation um, in, in, in that structure. Um, and, uh, and and I wonder, and I don't mean just at a sort of at this board level, but as you say, at a multi at a multi stakeholder level. And this should involve not just NGOs in the global south, but importantly also businessmen and businesswomen, uh, people the people that build the economies in these countries. Uh, they too should have a seat at that table um, and be able to kind of engage uh, with the developed world around funding priorities about all kinds of issues not just related to funding but also to trade buyers and all the rest which are all part and parcel of basically lifting these countries out of poverty um and so um so so this is a very very interesting very interesting idea um so i think you know um as i said the kind of the, the issues of trust of accountability, uh, of transparency, but then also of closeness, you know, because of course the, the more distance these organizations are, I mean, who knows anything about the World Bank other than that they somehow give loans. I mean, we don't, this is a very faceless, a very certainly from, you know, where I'm standing, I, I don't know anybody who would know anything about the workings of the World Bank, um, you know, how they operate, what they do, whether it's actually good what they do or not, how effective it is or whether it's not effective at all. We, we just don't know. I mean, I'm sure they're kind of publishing their reports and, you know, but, but they don't reach us. Uh, the general public. So in a way, this new organization would have to be much closer to home, every home, everywhere. You know, so this is a, and so this idea of a kind of a, a regional distribution and regional organizations, I would think would be a really important aspect there as well. Um, so, but of course, we are kind of far away from this. This is kind of a pipe dream at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the best we could hope is, is that some alliance forms and agrees on a number of fundamental governance principles that we all rally behind and kind of try to ensure that they're going to be enshrined in that new constitution. Um, but sort of looking at from your, from your perspective at the last, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, the post-war years leading up to now, uh, in terms of international development and cooperation and international organizations. What are the kind of the key lessons uh, that we can learn and apply to this new formation? Well, we know what doesn't work. <laughs> and uh, the UN, unfortunately, is quite an example, especially at top level. The Security Council doesn't work, actually. Uh, the assembly maybe works better, but it has no real impact as the, the decisions are not binding. So it uh, doesn't make the real difference. 
And uh, uh, the, other, the other thing which doesn't work is this total delegation of power from states to international organizations. Because uh, even if IMF and World Bank have done some good, in the end, uh, uh, the link between states and organization are very uh, weak because uh, minis finance ministers just meet once, twice a year as a general board of both the organizations, governing body, but they are more than almost 190. So I, I wonder which decisions can be really made by, by 200 people together. So uh, the appointed officials uh, run the thing and there is uh, no real control or exchange of information between the board and the states. In theory, they represent the states. But what I see is that national parliaments are not really interested in what they do because they have their, their day, daily business. There is usually some yearly report in the national parliaments, but I don't see any real accountability from, from the national level. And we are talking about the democratic countries. We are not talking, not even thinking about the non-democratic countries where there is no control at all by parliament. So I think we should move forward to some kind of uh, a direct uh, democratic governance at global level, because we, the, the original assumption about international organizations was that we get the govern, uh, democratic governance at national level. And so these, uh, would lend some credibility to the international level. But this doesn't really happen so, so much. And so uh, the, the public perception is that these are bureaucracies not really uh, accountable to anybody as, outside themselves. The, I mean, one of, one, of the, you know, one of the reasons, I guess, why national governments are not particularly interested over and above the level of funding they are meant to contribute uh, is because they consider it a sort of a, a cost, a net cost. Uh, it doesn't really buy them votes at the next election. And it, exactly. you know, they, they don't really see it almost as a distraction. Now, there have been a couple of examples where that has been different. And I, I would I would make the case that it will be different in this case too, uh, for the simple fact that climate change does affect us. But there's another case that really did affect us and an international organization that was sort of charged or tasked with dealing with that. And that's the World Health Organization and that's the recent pandemic. Um, and and it's, it's a very interesting because this was, you know, sort of in my lifetime, probably the first time that an international organization, the World Health Organization in that case, really kind of caused a level of anxiety among ordinary people in terms of can they help, can they not, do, can they give us information, can they not, can they mediate, can they do this and the other. And all of a sudden, I think there was a certain sense that we really do need these, or certainly need a World Health Organization. And all, also all the problems that you've mentioned, the lack of coordination, the, the distance and all, all of these became liabilities and made life extremely difficult and made it very hard for the World Health Organization to actually mediate and to coordinate. But maybe, I mean, I don't know whether you've been following that a little bit and there's some lessons that of course the World Health Organization, I believe is, 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 is asking for changes to the governing structure uh, to, to basically address these shortcomings. Um, I agree with you that WHO was uh, one of the first international organizations which really made it to the great public through uh, TV news during the pandemic. So people realized that these organs and bodies are important for them. And uh, the way that they are efficient or not really affects their lives. I think the other body which sometimes make uh, to the news is uh, is really the UNFCCC, so the Secretariat for the Climate, so the, the COPs and so on. But people really do not know that most of the decisions are not binding. The Paris Agreement is really not so binding, it's all implemented on a voluntary base. And I think uh, most of the public opinion would be shocked to know that we have this big emergency and it's all up to the voluntary decisions by member states to comply or not. So I think that we need a big cultural shift there, not only the public opinion awareness about how important the global level is for the daily life. So it's not something we don't care because uh, what, what really matters is who is at the government at national level. 
it, it matters because uh, it affects all the states in the world in the end, if they work well or not. But also it matters because, uh, <clears throat> because uh, if they don't work properly, we all in the end will suffer the consequences. Mm -hmm. And so the, the cultural shift is not needed only in the big public, it's also needed, I think, in the media. So this would make so much a difference if we got more information about what's going on at, at European, at the global level, we, uh, we don't have really, many people don't have really the perception of how important are the levels beyond the state. And so even if sometimes they even could contribute or could participate in some mechanisms, they don't even know they can. So I think we need to, to work also on the information level, both on the big public and on the media. I mean, what was interesting about the pandemic, and I think there is a very similar dynamic with you know, climate change, was that, if you like, the, um, the, the policies um, and the strategies to contain um, the, the, the virus in one part of the world had a direct impact and indeed a lethal impact uh, on other parts in the world. Um, because you you know there's only a certain amount of containment that is possible, and so if you have a virus run wild in a particular part of the world and you can't actually contain it there, then it's going to come to you. We we, we know that, um, and I think climate change in a way is a bit like that. And there's going yeah. to be a lot of very important decisions that will have to be made related, you know, like uh, economic decisions, investment decisions related to that loss and damage fund. Um, you know, uh, of course, I think there is an understanding that this should be investment in sustainable uh, uh, technology and sustainable industries and sustainable agriculture and all the rest. I think that understanding is there, but what exactly does that mean? Um, and, and so I think there's going to be a real issue around um around the, the the governance which goes way beyond uh, what the world bank would have to do in terms of governance when it the only thing the world bank has to concern itself with is whether it's going to get repaid um but that's actually not the main concern with the loss of damage fund the main concern is is that people aren't dying like at a kind of genocidal scale uh, and that the world isn't going to burn down i mean this is a different the, the, the concerns are different at least I think that is the perception globally that we need to have some structure that kind of provides some safeguards against this total meltdown. And the, 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 the loss of damage fund is kind of seen as, as that kind of last stop. Um, so um, in terms of governance, um, you know, uh, are there any kind of like, if you like any governance principles or ideas that you consider would need to be, would be different say in a fund like, or should be different, in a fund like um, uh, uh, the Loss and Damage Fund or the World Health Organization uh, versus like say the World Bank or, or you know the World Trade Organization, which have also a very important remit, but it's not a life and death situation in the same way. Well, as, as, I, as I told you, I think the basic would be uh, moving from this uh, only states model. So this is really, if we remain there, I don't expect anything really new to happen. So uh, having on board uh, people, companies, uh, NGOs, this is vital. We can imagine this in many different ways, but basically we need to overcome the on this states, uh, only states model. The, the other thing is that also the donors and the recipients cannot be only states. So not only in the governance, but also in the two sides that you already observed. So to wrap up, we need to overcome this model on any side. <laughs> on any so, but that also, it follows from that, and I couldn't agree more, but it follows from that, that if you have on the donor side, also the private sector, industry, and, and, and so on and so forth, but also the kind of civil society in the form of, you know, like uh, trust foundations, uh, but also possibly in terms of individuals who can, donate directly, then of course, to have these additional sources of income, um, you need to have additional levels of representation, don't you? I mean, that, that goes without saying. It goes without saying that if the countries are not the only donors, they are not only the only one conditioning the decision on the, on the expenses, on the budget. 
So this means also reducing the influence of the bigger countries over the smaller ones. So it has a big impact. I don't imagine as donors only the, uh, you know, the, the big finance companies or the banks. I imagine also many social responsible companies who could decide to, to have a, a little additional price on things and advertise these that uh, when you buy this, you contribute for one person to the, to the loss and damage fund and to, to stop climate change, to reduce the impact of climate change, helping the developing countries to, to face the, the crisis connected to climate change. So I think people would like to contribute if you create some ways for them to do it, even with little, little, little contributions from many people may, may go a long way in building a big contribution in the end. And of course, beyond building out from there, there is great scope for partnership structures. You know, I'm thinking much funding. You can imagine a Soros Foundation or, uh, you know, uh, Open Society Foundation to, to say, say, well, we go in alongside the loss and damage fund on a much funding basis. For every, you know, two whatever dollars coming from the loss and damage fund, we're going to put in another two dollars. But we want to have a say in how the money is spent. And I think those kind of partnership arrangements uh, also will need governance uh, because, again, you know, for, for very obvious reasons, you don't want this to be abused in, in, in whatever kind of ways because you can also see how this could corrupt. The whole system. So again, you need to have, in a way, a governance structure that allows and encourages the right kinds of partnerships uh, and builds out from there. Of course, there are many possible transparency tools, like uh, a register for all the donors and uh, a register for the recipients and the register for the projects that we are financing so that people can access online information about where the money goes, publishing the budget. And so I think that we, we know many, many good practices that could be transferred to this, this new fund. The point is how far states, which are at the moment the, 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 the actors, because they, they are the members in a way of the transitionary committee, how far the states will go to change the paradigm. I mean, there's something to be said for what I might call a sort of a dynamic model. You see, if you set the bar very high, um, for kind of the kind of incorporation and the, the, the launch of the fund, then you, because of all the risks associated with that launch and with that kind of, you know, that big step means that governments and principal funding bodies will opt for a very safe structure, a, a very traditional, a very a structure that they have, you know, seen many times before. Um, if, on the other hand, you would have sort of trigger points, so you mm -hmm. sort of say, well, let's start with a relatively conventional st structure, but allow for this thing to grow. And when it grows to point X, then an X additional governance structure needs to be added. And that might then involve business or that might involve civil society or that might. So you have a sort of a, a stage rollout of the fund and the development and the governance in a way kind of grows with that. So you don't have this kind of like all or nothing kind of throw off the dice, kind of get it right or don't, you know, at the start. And then you're stuck with a, a, a structure that you have to live with for the next 10 years, at least. Um, would that not be another kind of way sort of saying, well, let's kind of have a, a staged approach with trigger points. We're starting with something that's very small, very unambitious. In fact, you know, it's something that we could do now, like just a tenth of the funding required to get started. But as funding builds up and we have a clear ambition to build this up, as funding builds up, the governance structure evolves along with that. Would that be a feasible, is there any precedent for that kind of structure? Yes, I think from a legal point of view, it's very feasible. I, I can mention a number of precedents in the, in the European legal order, for instance. We started the, the internal market in the 50s with the unanimity vote, but it was already after a transitional period of 12 years, an automatic shift toward the majority voting, for instance. And uh, there is at the moment the possibility to change the treaties uh, unanimously, but there is a simplified procedure to change the policies in the treaties with the majority. So, uh, and there are national ratification. So you can imagine many ways to do this. And uh, I think it is a very good idea. And also the level of funding could be the trigger to, to, to add additional bodies 
and the additional pieces to the building. Also, another important thing is, I think, is the, the revision procedure, should be because the, the rules, the initial rules, should not be written in stone, but you can imagine a procedure to amend this without a unanimous or a very high majority, which makes it almost impossible, as in many multilateral international agreements. And so we need a flexible mechanism to improve along the way. So it's, it's, I think it's very feasible and could be a, a, the way to, 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 to start the process without too many ambitions because it's difficult, but preparing a path for more ambitions. Uh, I mean, the, basically what, 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 what one would do is what one would trade some of the kind of bells and whistles that you could have from the start for flexibility. So rather than sort of saying, whatever we do, that's going to be for the next 10 years, we're sort of saying, well, this is from the beginning designed as a dynamic growth model, um, but we're very happy to start, you know, in a very humble way so that all those fears that might exist uh, can be dealt with as, as, as we grow this. Um, so what you then have to do, of course, is you'd have to sort of like say, what's the floor? You know, you know, what, what do we? What, what's the kind of the minimum and kind of an, on in terms of ambition that 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 could be acceptable to somebody like yourself who's got a clear idea of how these institutions should be structured? What would be the minimum, like a sort of a, an entry level, a starting point? And what would be the big vision where, where this could go? Yeah, and what would be that? And 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 then that would be a very interesting kind of way of you know uh, of, of thinking about it. I, I think. Um, and of course, you know, returning to those five fundamental principles that I mentioned earlier, or whatever it is, five, ten, like, the number doesn't matter. Um, you know, they would have to hold for the for the floor model, for the entry level model, but they would also have to hold for the big model. So that would be a really interesting way of of thinking thinking about it. Um, and um, yeah, that's just a sort of a thought a thought on the side. Any any final thoughts that you have in terms of what? What, what could happen next day or what should happen next? Well, for sure, uh, the decision uh, establishing this transitionary committee uh, calls for two workshops during the year uh, to be organized by the UNFCCC uh, to discuss the evolution and the governance and the funding of this body. So at a certain point, we should open some leaking of information about how this process is going. And so I, I will be hoping to share something more along the, the year. But for sure, by November, December, and the next COP, we should have a project in place. So, so um, do we know who is going to be on that committee? No, because uh, uh, they have already been appointed uh, because the decision taken in November say that we'll, they will be appointed by December. So apparently they've been appointed, but I, I couldn't find any information about names or, so I don't know who they so are, know, but like somewhere box. there are these people. And so I, I, I hope that after the first, uh, at least after the first workshop, maybe we will have a list of people. And this could be a good moment to send to them a manifesto or a proposal about these five, six, seven points, and then starting to integrate uh, this process or trying to interact with them in some way. I think that would be a very nice, like, sort of goal, wouldn't it? Is to say, well, we know that they have these the, these sessions, um, and if you know, leading up um, to the first of these two sessions, one could basically send them a submission, you know, and obviously also maybe publish, publish it in, you know, in, in a newspaper and, and kind of get it into peer reviewed journal um, to, to kind of get it out there. Um, uh, maybe do a little a sort of a small a round table or even a small conference around it to, 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 to um, um, and, and get, get this into circulation and then sort of see whether that, that's been taken on, whether somebody actually gets back to you, see whether somebody's actually interested in the dialogue. It may well be possible that they are interested, but they simply haven't got you know they don't know who to talk to either um and so so that could be a very interesting thing to kind of to to try and do so when again did you say the 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 the, uh, the actual workshop was going to happen the first is supposed to be in march i don't know anything about the second but the first has already been uh, in some somehow planned for march so if i discover anything interesting uh, i will reach out because uh, i think we could start hosting on your platform or 
on my blog and the tools we already have, the, at first, uh, let's say, little, little uh, uh, proposal to see if we can get some traction on the idea of creating a group working on this. That sounds very interesting to me, and I think that sounds definitely worth kind of pursuing. So we should we should see, and of course, my sense is, it might be wrong, but my sense is that in a year's time, not that much will have happened. Uh, <laughs> the, yeah, I, I don't, me too. <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't think this is going to kind of move at lightning speed. Um, and so I think there will be ways in which, if we are building up some kind of interest groups around this, there will be ways in which we can sort of interface with that, I would hope. Wonderful. Excellent. Well, Susanna, thank you ever so much. It's been very, very interesting talking to you. I, I know you have a democracy dialogue hang up, coming up not too far in the future as well. When is that democracy dialogue happening again? The next uh, the international democracy dialogue will be in uh, 18, 19 of May. 18, 19 of May. Um, and um, have you already put out a, a put out a sort of a call participation? Can people? If yes, there is a call for papers. I will send it to you. So if you want to to circulate it, I will be very grateful. And Excellent. the topics this year will be democracy tools scalable at all levels, from the local community to the global one. And, so, and very briefly, in, in in a nutshell, what is this upcoming uh, democracy dialogue about? What's the what's the what's the focus? The focus is on tools, so citizens' assemblies, uh, uh, litigation, uh, uh, balance of interests, uh, the, the typical, the people, the democratic tools, and how some some models can be applied on a multi-level uh, approach from the local to the global. Excellent, excellent. Uh do you have any idea whether people are going to do stuff? I mean, because litigation is becoming quite a, an issue within the, the, the climate movement as well. Um, yeah. Climate litigation. Do, do you have anybody talking about climate litigation at your uh, democracy dialogues already? Do you know? I still don't know, but I'm sure that somebody will talk about climate litigation because this is a very interesting example of moving forward in individuals' rights through uh, national or international courts. So I, I think it's it's a very interesting tool for, for uh, civil society. Excellent. So very I mean, effective. if anybody anybody's interested in uh, the uh, democracy dialogues, and of course they take place in a most beautiful part of the world in Southern Italy, and the weather is going to be just amazing. So um, anybody interested in taking part in this, do get in touch with uh, Susanna and you can do this through her website uh, and you can also do it through the university website. We will find the links under this video um, uh, later on, either today or tomorrow. Yeah, so maybe maybe one or the other person get, will get in touch with you about that. Too. Wonderful, thank you. Susanna, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure to have you and um, we, we catch up and we, we should have a sort of a offline conversation, uh, uh, behind the camera conversation about, about how to, in a way, kind of try to build up a little bit of momentum to, to, to have an input into, into, this new, into this new organization. Wonderful. Thank you, Nico. Thank, Thank you, you very for much inviting for inviting me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Have a good day. Have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye.